listening to uh, Philangelo reminded me that when I was uh, what is the equivalent of graduate school in France, we don't have graduate school, but something like that. I wanted to be a journalist. This was my ambition. And I uh, contributed uh, articles about history in a paper called Nice Matin, city of Nice in France. And then eventually, um, some good connections, I ended up working as a reporter for a magazine which still exists called Point de Vue Image du Monde. And this reminded me because all of a sudden when Veronica organized that great Bastille Day celebration, one of my first, very first assignment from the, the senior editor in Paris was to give me a photographer and told me to go on the Bastille Day different dancing in the street, you know, in Paris, it's free dance, and to go from one to one and write a feature. And I go to a little place on the left bank uh, <coughs> called Place Fürstenberg, which is absolutely a beautiful little square. And there was dancing going on. And I noticed a beautiful blonde girl dancing one side, true story. And the guy, very, very interesting, black hair, all free. And I told my photographer, this will be phenomenal, we put them together. So I went first to the girl, and I said, would you mind for the photographer, if we rearrange you, because I knew that was the most important, I knew the guy would accept it. So I got the guy, and I put together the other couple dancing. And this was a feature photograph in the point of image du monde at the time. I don't know if they still remain as a couple, but <laughs> the type of things when you're a journalist, you got to do is invent a situation by right time. So anyway, that, that reminded me. Well, uh, when I entered graduate school in the uh, University of Illinois, uh, I um, started first with uh, with a professor who was a specialist of Louis XIV. And I became his uh, teacher, the TA, you know, and then, and then I, after, I finally, uh, after six years of hard work, completed my thesis, got my PhD. My advisor at the time wanted very much to be ready for publication. So as tradition requires, you go to your alma mater university press, and which was the university press of Illinois. They were very nice about my manuscript. They said, we don't do African history, and my PhD or major was about not African study, African history and military history. But if you come back, and write something, we need something about Illinois, we'll be glad to hear. Well, to make a long story short, my manuscript was published by Brandeis University, which was very good. And eventually I came back and looked at Illinois history, which at that time I knew, I knew in general because of French in North America. Very quickly I realized the state of Illinois was not what was all about was basically the whole Midwest. So I got involved and was a kind of love at first sight. In order to write about something, you have to know the place. When I did my PhD about African history, I traveled basically all French Afri African, which was at that time just become independent. And at the time, I traveled with, it's hard to believe, in public transportation. You wouldn't do that today in Africa, believe me. So when I started with the Midwest, one of the first things I did was to go, what I found out was the heart of the penetration in the Midwest, which is in Illinois, the fort, the shot, the fort. They are across from the Mississippi River, the um, 
city in the town of saint Yeah, I still remember driving down from Rosebud. You don't go to Chester, you turn on the right, and all of a sudden, you go down to a magnificent grove of trees and a valley, and there's another world, a small road, and here you are in a very small town called Prairie du Rocher, which is, of course, called Prairie du Roche. And it was, became for me love at first sight. Well, the whole, the whole thing about this area we call the Midwest, which I discovered, and I hope to make you discover along if you haven't done it yet, this was what we call the connection, the, the, the sort of land bridge from the Great Lakes to the Mississippi River for the French colonial empire, so to speak, of North America, which was really two parts, New France or Canada and Louisiana. And in between were those people very little was ever written about, it is the Midwest. That eventually we try to make known as a French heritage corridor initiative. So what is about which is unique and unsung about it? It's unsigned because I think, uh, first of all, it's hard enough to make Americans by and large be interested in anything which is not the 13 colonies, and again the 13 colonies. Nobody talks very much about the fact that uh, the whole South and Southwest was Hispanic, <laughs> all the way to San Francisco. And certainly very few people would be interested by knowing the Midwest was actually a French colonial existence. So, the first task is to convince people that is interesting. And by writing about the extraordinary saga, which was started by Joliet and Marquette, and that's something, few names that everybody knows about. But less known is, of course, La Salle. La Salle, who was renamed was Robert Cavalier, you know, was from Rouen, for Normandy, was this young man full of uh, ideas of enterprise, who was in a movement of the day which was to discover this famous hope for great passage, which would be that river, that mysterious river, the Michichipi, the great water in Algonquin language, which maybe was going to the Pacific Ocean, and then would make this wonderful idea to go to the real goal, the riches of the Orient, Japan, China, India, directly to North America. Of course, it was not the case. And eventually, La Salle, by going down to the Gulf of Mexico after three attempts, the third attempt was successful, and uh, La Salle completed the trip with a long, very smartly, a long notaire royal, a royal notary. A notary is not a public notary in the American concept. A notaire is like a lawyer doing only civil cases. We still have this in France. A notaire is a position, actually a legal position that you buy. And so the notaire royal could officially take notes that La Salle, in the name of Louis XIV, claimed legally, officially, the whole of North America, which was not part of the 13 colonies. Which was a tremendous thing. But when you write um, a story like this, you find out interesting things you discover. And even more unsigned as La Salle is his assistant whose name was officially Henri Tonti, but really was Enrico Tonti. <laughs> and he 
His father had been the governor of Gaeta near Naples. Uh, he had trouble with a local, uh, local runner, the local ruler, of, and had to escape to France, to Paris, before Versailles. And uh, it's known because there is an insurance system for La Tontine, which he created. And his son, 17 years old, what you do, you get him a, uh, a position and he became a cadet on the French Navy, lost a nerve, lost a, a hand, was recruited to Alassar in Paris, and ended up uh, in North America, the most powerful guy, the most faithful guy. So, I got my the first book of the time of the French in the heart of North America, was published in 1992. And the publisher at the time, the Alliance Francaise, was a kind of skeptical. They said, well, you know, we, we, I don't see it will take a, well, it did very well. And today we have now the fourth edition, and I think about 15,000 books have been sold. Uh, what I tried to write in a way, uh, that's what we call today public history. I did public history ahead of the time, so to speak. Uh, I knew that my fellow uh, scholars, and I knew it well, and when you are in academia, you are constantly working with uh, my uh, fellow star scholars, and I was uh, the five years president of the French colonial, history of, um, colonial historical society of North America. Uh, it's nice to talk to each other, but in my opinion, it's a bit of a waste of time. What you have to talk to the public, because if we want history to survive, we have not only to address ourselves to our fellow historians, but we have to address to the public, like Jack, who just came in, doing beautifully today in a, in a journal, like Vic Johnson did magnificently. So, uh, it's very important to reach the public. If we want history to survive, we have to reach the public and to make it simple, not sim simplistic, make it this different. As I wrote my book in a, in a sort of cinematographic idea, uh, not taking shortcuts, uh, not obliging people to look at the end of chapter notes, but enough to give them the history of this phenomenal history. The French were here uh, in the idea eventually to this big North American empire that the king never realized he had. Uh, it was very difficult to sell colonial ambition to the French monarchy because the French monarchs, particularly Louis XIV and Louis XV, were really interested in Europe. So one of the key to understand French colonial history is that um, French people did not emigrate. They had no reason to. But everything is connected. It's connected to the economy. The economy is connected to the culture. The culture of civil wars is connected to the weather. And as a result of this, it was very difficult to get people to come over here. If you didn't have a large demography in North America, you were doomed. Because the fact is, if you look at the 13 colonies, you offered a one-way ticket, and not exactly in first class, arrival in the colonies, work for six, seven years as indentured servant, and eventually, if you survive, you get 70 acres, and people are rushing, oh, what a deal! And of course, what a deal for the Scots, uh, who were pushed out of their properties, for the Irish, who were put down continuously, was a great deal. So they rushed. So you had one million people in the 13 colonies. One million people guarantees you 100,000 militia. And that was the strength which you find out when you look at the French in the war. The French were doomed not to succeed on great maximum. You have 50,000 people from Quebec all the way to Mobile, which was French, 
Biloxi, New Orleans, 50,000 people give you barely 10,000 militia. Considering that the French monarchy could not easily reinforce the troops because, remember, Britannia ruled the seas. It was a given, a given story. And it read us in that big story of Quebec, Canada, and Louisiana, we represented an extraordinary part. And it started with Fort Saint Louis des Illinois, which now you call Star Rock. Uh, it continues with Peoria and goes to Saint Geneviève, which is absolutely a gem in Missouri, uh, for the shot. And eventually, this is a big, long corridor. So this is what I wrote in my book within the context of the history of the time, with a chapter about the Native Americans specifically, why this unique relationship the French had, which is part cultural. And if you know France, you know they can be uppity, their nose up, but they are not racist. And that's a big difference. The French intermarry with the Native American. Maybe intermarry is maybe a generous word. Okay. So Jesuits make sure you will marry back, you know, those French voyageurs, you know, after whole day on the canoe, you know, they enjoy a good pipe and they enjoy a good conversation with somebody from a different sex. And had children, amazing, they have but they always recognize the children, always. That's why you have this enormous number of people who are French Indian today. So this is one of the chapters. The French had even an always a different relationship with the blacks. There's a special chapter about it. Well, certainly was slavery, starting in 1730. But in Louisiana, when one of the only tribes were pro-British, the Cherokees, the Chickasaw, became a problem for um, the whole area here, for the Chart, uh, Cahokia. They raised troops among the slaves that they freed. They gave them command, and they created a unit which survived amazingly all the way to 1812 which became the, the battalion of free men of colors. Of course, when Louisiana was sold in 1804 by Napoleon Bonaparte, and the Americans took over Louisiana, when they realized, what, what, blacks with guns, you crazy? <laughs> they sort of tried to destroy that unit. There is also a special chapter with the church, the importance of the Jesuits, is essential in that colonization. Although the colonization, obviously the Jesuits were doing their own thing, which had nothing to do with the monarchy. So by and large, my goal was to make known uh, the existence of this unique corridor, so to speak, along the waterways, essential to the French presence in North America connecting Canada and Louisiana. Now, to end up with a, an observation of that history, as fear, not this fair justice, there's a, a re, not rewriting, but was in an attempt to rewrite history. Uh, history is based on reality. Reality is often forgotten from one generation to another. Also, history is written by the winners. Okay, that, This is why I look at World War II. I went through as a child very differently uh, that people look at it. So in the, the concept of history, um, you cannot apply the morality of today. Uh, by the morality of today, <laughs> the French um, you know, we were a little bit immoral in, in the relationship. Well, this was a time where you didn't 
ask questions. Certainly with slavery, this is a concept of the day. You cannot rewrite history with the morality of today. At any rate, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I've been sitting quietly here. I know the crowd is going to rush and we'll make Veronica very happy. Thank you very much.